Good morning. My name is Sarah Sigmund, and I don't work here, so I wanted to introduce myself, in case you don't know me. Um, I am a, um, let me start over. Can you flip the slide? This is my family, which you will see in a second. I'm married to Jonathan. He's the executive pastor here. He was also the good-looking guy with the guitar singing a minute ago. We have two kids. They are entering kindergarten and second grade this year in the fall. Um, I've been at Calvary Assembly for 15 years, and I've been a Bills fan since I was six. So I'm what you call a stayer. I get in my lane and I drive. Um, I'm a public school teacher. I just finished my 13th year. I teach third grade right now. And I like to read. I like to cook. My follow-up hobby to cooking is eating. Um, in the interest of you knowing me well, I don't like board games at all. And I know that a lot of you are thinking like, oh, she just hasn't played. Yes, I have. And I didn't like it. It's not a fun activity for me. I, I also don't like condiments, like anything that goes on your sandwich and makes the bread soggy. So ketchup, mustard, mayo, relish, blech. And if you are ever invited to our house for anything and those are out, it is advisable to check the date because they frequently expire. So that's me. Now you know me. Um, I also want to introduce what we're talking about this morning. We're continuing with the letter in 1 Peter. And when I read you the section from this morning, I want you to hear it as a letter, because we read it as a book, but it was written as a letter from one man to a group of people. It was written by Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus, and it was written to a church in Asia Minor, which at the time was under the control of the Roman Empire. It was written after a time when Peter had been imprisoned for his faith in Jerusalem. That's helpful background, so hear it as someone who had been released from about three years in prison and right almost a couple years before Peter eventually lost his life. Um, last piece of helpful information, this letter was written during the reign of Nero, and we're gonna come back to that, but that's an important piece to know that it was a difficult time of suffering. So before I read it, will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Thank you for your word. Amen. So he starts his letter with the word beloved. Like we would say, dear so-and-so, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their soul to a faithful creator while doing good. So we're gonna reread the letter in pieces and look at the ideas that he was trying to send to these people he loved and cared about, almost like a pastor writing a letter to his church. So he starts with the beloved. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. So he, he brings this up because our expectations are really important. When Jonathan and I bought our first house, we had lived in an apartment and then we bought a house, and I thought it was extremely convenient that these nice people who had owned it before us had already planted all the grass. The grass looks nice. And when I was growing up, I was the oldest of four kids and all the neighborhood kids played on our yard. So my parents took very good care of our lawn in the sense that they mowed it. But like we had ruined all the grass on like home plate, first base, second base, third base, and the part that you had to scuff up to get up the tree. So it wasn't like a, a big thing, they mowed it. 
And I thought that this lawn was fabulous and it was wonderful and we didn't need to touch it. And as it turns out, Jonathan had a very different expectation about lawn care and he had the hose all draped out where he was gonna kill that perfectly good grass and put in like dirt and mulch and plants, all of which cost money. And let the record show that it did look really nice when he finished, but we had a really different expectation about uh, what was needing to be done there in that I thought it was nothing. When you have a wrong or a different expectation, it can lead to a conflict. And when we have the expectation that I'm probably not going to suffer because I'm a Christian, that's a wrong expectation and it can lead to a sense of betrayal because when the suffering does come, it feels like God failed me or God let me down because our expectation was incorrect. So he's starting by correcting the expectation. He's saying, don't be surprised when the suffering comes. It doesn't mean you did something wrong. It doesn't mean God is mad at you. Don't be surprised when the suffering comes. And he's correcting that false expectation, putting in a correct one that this is going to be part of your life. And again, remember who's writing the letter. So this is Peter. Peter had just gotten out of jail for three years because of his faith. Also, also this is Peter who was a disciple who traveled around with Jesus, with his own ears, heard Jesus say the words that we read in Matthew 16. Then Jesus told the disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Peter heard those words. So he knew from the mouth of Jesus that this was the path. And then with his own eyes, he saw the suffering and the crucifixion of Jesus. So his expectations were correct. He understood that there was going to be suffering as part of his life, and he was making sure his readers knew that too. Do not be surprised when the suffering comes. And then he goes on to verses 14 through 16. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Okay, so he's pulling apart two different kinds of suffering. For the record, there's a lot more kinds of suffering, but here he's kind of pulling apart two. The first one is what he calls suffering for the name of Christ or suffering as a Christian. Again, an individual who had lost his physical freedom for three years in jail is writing about this. At the time the letter was written, so Nero came to power in AD 54, and Nero was an unstable and violent man. He actually had his wife and his mother murdered because of their opposition to him, for reference for you. This letter was written right before the fire in Rome, which would have been about 64 AD. And at that point, so again, a couple years after this letter, the, the needle really shifted because Nero placed the, blown, the blame for the great fire on the Christians that were in Rome. And their persecution ramped up to the point of really horrible, violent public executions and the loss of all of their material beings. I think it's fair to infer that Peter, having watched Nero's trajectory, kind of saw the writing on the wall. Not in like a prophetic, this is coming, but he had seen the things that Nero was doing and the way he was acting. And I think Peter understood that the church was on the cusp of a really difficult, painful time of the kind of suffering that comes from your decision to follow Jesus. That's what happened to these people. And I think Peter was preparing them for that kind of suffering. But then he also talks about another kind of suffering when he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. This is a special kind of suffering affectionately called, you brought it on yourself or you made your bed. But before we like brush it, I have felt that where I did bring it on myself, but I, it really hurts. And, and sometimes even worse, it hurt somebody I loved. And so I want to land on it for one second because there's a special vocabulary word we use in church for that kind of suffering, and it's called conviction, and it's a mix of pain and hope because it's what the Holy Spirit gives you when you did make your bed. 
and this is your fault, but it doesn't have to stay like this. This is a special piece of the gospel where yes, you did something wrong and it's the recognition of it and the pain that came from it, but also it's the hope that you can still be forgiven and you can move in a different direction. This doesn't define you and it's not the rest of your life. We call that conviction. So if that is a piece of suffering that you have gone through recently, don't get stuck under that because that's not a permanent place, that's conviction. There's a way out of that when you repent. So he is pulling those two kinds of suffering apart so that people don't get confused. There's the kind of suffering that was coming for the Christians and then there's the kind of suffering that comes because we are failed people and we make mistakes. Peter wrote a really fun letter for me to talk to you about, about suffering and judgment. So we're gonna go on to the judgment piece because you're all in such a good mood. When you look at verse 17, it says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? All right, let's talk about judgment. So the first thing that he's making the point of is that judgment is passed by a judge and God gets to be that judge. This is a tough one for me because just for the record, my judgment is very good. I'm a strong 95%. Like I can size up a situation and pretty much figure it out and I am right 95% of the time. But that 5% I'm wrong disqualifies me. I don't get to be the judge. God is the judge. And when we make the decision to accept Jesus and to follow him, we give up that role and we let it go back to him. So when Peter's talking about judgment coming, we need to recognize that that's the judgment of God. It's not ours to bring. God will take care of it. A couple years ago, I bought um, a, a Bible that was like a Bible in a year. Have you seen those? Like they break it up and you read a part every day. It took me two years. There's no trophy for early finishers. But, but I read, so I read it straight through and I, I got a lot of new insights about it because there's ideas and themes in the Bible that come up over and over and over through all the different eras that the pieces were written. And one of them is that God is referred to as the judge from the very earliest of the books in the Bible. God is the judge. That's his role, not mine. So when the Bible talks about judgment coming, God gets to be the judge. Um, in Psalms, there's a poem. This is my favorite line of it where it says, and the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is the judge. Another great news piece for us, now that we got fired from being the judge, is that judgment actually starts here. There's a temptation in the church for us to look out at everybody doing really bad things and be like, mm, judgment is coming for you. But the, the text says that the judgment starts in the house of God with the people of God. You know, before coronavirus, we used to have big school assemblies. Remember that when you were little, your teacher would walk you down and watch it be a cute little show. So teachers don't actually love supervising assemblies. No matter how carefully I line my kids up, when we get to the auditorium and they're all in their seats, whichever one I really need to be close to, you know, the one who's gonna be naughty, is one row ahead of me and all the way at the end. So even if I'm hissing, like, psst, psst, can't hear me. So it's not, it's not a thing we love supervising. So teachers tend to find ways to maybe not have to go to the assembly. Like maybe somebody else can take my class or, you know, I have um, a thing. And so a couple of my friends were like renowned for this. They went to almost no assemblies. It was almost a gift. They could always find someone to take their class. And they got into an argument about it one day, the two of them yelling at each other about this because neither of them ever did it. And my one friend got really mad and he was trying to say, check your own house. But he was so agitated, it came out as, look in your own backyard. And it took us a strong five minutes to figure out what he was saying. But he meant, check your own house. And that's part of the idea of judgment. 
that Peter's doing here. If judgment starts in the house of God, it's not look out there and what God's gonna do to judge you. It's check your own house. You know, we have the entire canon of scripture to guide us in our decision-making. That's a huge gift of wisdom that's been given to us. Um, There's another part in the Bible where it says, to whom much is given, much is expected. Or as Spider-Man's uncle said, with great power comes great responsibility. A lot of people know this important idea. We have a lot of wisdom. We have the Holy Spirit. And the judgment of God actually starts here. So it's not a judgment thing where we look out and think how bad it's going to be for them. It's a chance to look at ourselves. Check your own house. The last piece about judgment that I think we, that we push back on, that we resist, that Peter's calling back, is that judgment shows us the nature of our own rescue, and we don't love that. Because he uses the word scarcely saved. If the righteous are scarcely saved, there is not a lot to be arrogant about in the phrase scarcely saved. The nature of the rescue of God It has none of my own merit in it. The gospel story that you find in scripture is that God came down incarnate as a person. No thanks to me. Lived a model life to teach the kingdom of God. Allowed his own painful death. Was resurrected by the power of God to offer me free grace and forgiveness. There is nothing to be arrogant about in that story. Judgment shows us the nature of what happened to us. It's our rescue. And when we let him be the judge and we feel the depth of our rescue, that's a really holy place. Suffering, judgment, I'm so fun. You guys are so lucky. All right, so I, like I said, I've read the whole Bible. I love Bible studies. It's my thing. My favorites are, I like the history books. I like the prophet books. I like the theology books. I like Hebrews. I like the epistles. I actually have a harder time connecting to and understanding the poetry books. I hang with it, but, but those are harder for me. But one of the things I found as I read is there's a lot of places in the Bible where there are pieces of really, really practical, practical step wisdom nuggets. And people miss them because there's a lot of other things in there, but there's several places in the Bible where the writer is handing you a piece of spiritual practical wisdom for here's what you do next. I call them marching orders, like super clear. This is the will of God in your situation. This is your marching order. And that's the last verse that he puts on here. He says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their soul to a faithful creator while doing good. So it's a three-step line. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. And remember, verse 12, that's everybody. Don't be surprised when it comes. We're all going to suffer. Entrust your soul to a faithful creator. When you're suffering, this is the internal work that you go through. It's the peace people can't see. When you're suffering, suffering and pain often coincide with doubt. And the the work of trusting your soul to a faithful creator is you deciding to continue to believe that the deepest, truest part of you, your soul, is still safe in the care of the one who made you, despite your pain. That's the internal work of suffering that you do in quiet, where nobody else sees it, that through the experience that only you know you're having, you continue to believe that your soul is safe with the one who made you. Um, There's a verse, again, in the Psalms, poems, but where the poet writes, the Lord is with me, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? That's the voice of someone who has entrusted their soul to a faithful creator. Because the answer to the question, what can mere mortals do to me? Well, they can do a lot to your body. And a lot of pain and suffering does come at the hands of other people. And so to have the right expectation that this this is a promise about your soul. Your soul 
is safe in the care of your faithful creator. That's the internal work of suffering, to believe that. And then it ends with, though, because we want to leave it there, because if we leave it there, that's you still on your couch with a box of Kleenex. But it ends with, while doing good. In the midst of your suffering, to entrust your soul to a faithful creator while doing good. That's the outward work of suffering. That's the, you staying engaged. And suffering, specifically grief, but suffering is exhausting. When you're in a lot of pain, and eight hours of sleep will feel like two. And there's a huge temptation when you're in pain to pull back, just like you do with physical pain, you pull back. But that's what he's saying is to while doing good. This is your outward work of suffering, that you stay engaged with your community of believers, that you're still following the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's your internal work. And to love your neighbor as yourself while doing good. Those are your marching orders through your painful times. And I'm not saying that lightly because it hurts, and I know it does. But that's the healthiest way through it that your soul stays engaged, and then your body is also present and part of it. So um, when I tried to consider the big message, I've been reading through 1 Peter this whole summer with everybody, and the big message that Peter keeps coming back to, because I joke about it, like, oh, what a fun thing, suffering. But it's an important thing, that's why he wrote the letter. I think he was trying to make the point that suffering is going to create a spiritual opportunity. The suffering piece is inevitable, but the opportunity that it creates, that's optional for you, what you do with it. And I think he was trying to make the point that suffering creates a spiritual opportunity. I wanna tell you a story because I have a temptation to listen to sermons with my head and I don't let them go the last 10 inches down to my heart. So I want to give you an example of a time when I was suffering and there was a spiritual opportunity inside of it. So I was sitting in my rocker. My daughter, Nora, was, I was holding her, which means it was any time between birth and 22 months when they put her ear tubes in, because pretty much I just held her for 22 months. But I was sitting in our rocking chair holding her upright, and I was in a lot a lot of pain. And there was a dream that I held so close to my heart for a long time and it was dead and it was over. And there was no, there was no change coming. There was no next step. There was no if then. It was gone and it was dead. And I felt that pain so deeply and my own lack of control to do anything about it. I was unfamiliar with the amount of sadness that was sitting on me. And I was sitting there holding her, and I was trying to pray. But it, it's hard to pray when things hurt that bad. And I was closing my eyes praying, and I saw in my head this quick little picture of me sitting in one of those little blue kiddie pools. You know what I'm talking about? They're about eight inches tall, plastic, Kmart. And me sitting in that little kiddie pool, and the kiddie pool was full of my own pain. Like it literally felt like I was sitting in my own pain. It hurt so bad, like marinating in it, if that makes sense. And a split second later in the picture, I turned my head and I saw God sitting in it with me. And nothing ever changed in that situation. There's no different ending. But I never thought about it the same again. And I knew, I knew that he was with me, entered into that pain for me, with me. And that was the spiritual opportunity. Not that my situation was gonna change but that suffering created a spiritual opportunity. So because Peter told us, and because I've been alive for like 30 something years, I'm aware that you have gone through suffering or that you are, or that you will, or maybe that you're really, really, really afraid 
of a certain kind of suffering because fear is its own kind of suffering. There's a level of fear and, and painful anxiety that is another kind of suffering. And anytime you feel that, that suffering, that's a spiritual opportunity. That's what Peter's showing you. So I'm gonna ask the music people to come back up because I felt like the work that takes ideas from our head to our heart has to come from the Holy Spirit. I don't know your story and I don't know your pain, but I know you have it because you live here. And I wanted to leave space for the Holy Spirit to give you whatever he wants to take your opportunity for. So I'm gonna pray for you that you would be able to open your mind to the places where it's hurt, where you don't like to think about, and to open up your heart to the possibility that he has something to show you or say to you, because he did that for me, and I think he'll do that for you too. So while the music people play, um, I'm gonna pray for you. Our Father in heaven, we believe that you're with us and you love us. Would you please come into the places where it hurts? Amen.